It's time for January 2024, which is a challenge to make as many pieces of music during the month of January as you can. Audra's ready. Are you? These could be full songs, little beats, loops, ideas, song starters, or even just a little noodling on your favorite instrument. The point is to exercise the music making muscle as often as possible. This year, I'm supplying members of the Music Production Club with tools, techniques, and prompts to help build inspiration each day during the month of January. Every day, you'll get a sample, a loop, an instrument, or an effect to experiment with. There'll be a prompt or activity to help you get started. And I've also created a calendar that you can use as a checklist so that you can form streaks to help build inspiration and motivation to keep going. You can share your jams in our Discord so you can hear what other people are doing and receive feedback and encouragement from other members. Every song on my last two albums, Passings and Rectangles, started as January jams. It's a great way to build discipline and motivation to create some music. To join in with the Music Production Club and all these fun activities, head over to brianfunk.com slash mpc. See you there. Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And on today's show, I have Andrew Huang. And I've been a longtime fan of Andrew's. He's doing great work. You probably know of him because uh, he's doing quite a lot of cool stuff. Got his hands on a lot of great things. He's, of course, famous for his YouTube channel, over 2 million subscribers. Um, he's releasing a book called Make Your Own Rules, which I'm very excited to talk about. He recently put out the Transit plugin with Baby Audio, which is awesome. Um, ghost pedal, flip sampler. Lots and lots of stuff. I'm surprised you're only one person, Andrew. Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> I am only one person, but I, I do collaborate and I do have a, a little team now, actually, which is so helpful. Yeah. I've noticed that in some of your stuff lately. You've, you're have you working with other people more on the, the last video you're making, uh, lo-fi music with kids toys, which mm -hmm. is so right up my alley. I love any kind of music that's made with things that aren't musical instruments. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like I, I really, I think collected. I don't know if that's the right word, but I, I built a lot of my audience from that type of content. And it's funny because I don't. It's it's just like one way to approach music, but I think I did it so much for a certain period, and it is a thing that you're more likely to kind of have viral moments with or whatever because it's a bit out of the ordinary. That I, I built a lot of my audience that way, and if I don't do it for a while. And then I bring it back. For me, it's just like, oh, this is what I'm doing this week. But for the audience, it's like, oh, man, getting back to the Foley, the found sound. Like, wow, this is the classic Andrew vibe or whatever, which is um, interesting to me that, mm. you know, it, it's a very different perception, I think, uh, from a viewer compared to how I just kind of like approach things and use what I need to use for the given project or idea. Um but yeah, yeah. So that was that was the most recent video. Although actually, just this this afternoon, I put out uh, my top plugins of the year roundup. So second okay. most recent, I guess now. <laughs> Exciting, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you had like uh, Ryan was working with you, I believe his name was right. Um, That's right. Yeah. yeah. So he's the newest uh, addition to the team. Um, great guy who just uh, happened to be local. I, I put out for the first time ever. Put out a job posting. Um, I think that was just two, three months ago, because up until now, I've grown my little team uh, through just friends and family. Um, you know, my brother-in-law was my first hire, uh, unless you count his sister, my wife, who um, at, at a certain point took over a lot of the um, business side of, of what has to happen uh, when you do what I do. But um yeah, and then just like friends or friends of friends like came into the picture. And so for the first time, we felt like, well, let's do some outreach. We don't know anybody already who can kind of tackle this many hats type of job that, you know, we're going to have to have because there's so many things that need to be done in uh, an operation like this. And uh, I think this is kind of the way a lot of things are moving. You don't have just like a color grader and a video editor and a mixer or whatever, but like a lot of people can do a lot of different things. And that's the kind of person that we were looking for. And Ryan's been fantastic at that. But yeah, we also have um, a couple other people that have shown up on my channel more recently, like maybe the audience has seen some of my camera people. Um, and then Marty is another kind of music production 
assistant, mixing assistant, um, who's uh, just kind of like ad hoc hours, not a not a full time employee or anything. And then also, I've, I've been doing so much stuff with Rob Scallon hmm. because we just want to work together more. We're best friends in real life as well as on screen, I guess. And so, um, yeah, just just being able to shoot more collaboratively has been really great for me. And in part, it's also because now with a family, I'm just trying to find ways to do videos where other people are worrying about the camera. Other people can take care of the edit. Um, so yeah. Right. I mean, all that stuff, it's a lot of work when you're trying to do all that by yourself. There's, you're basically wearing a hundred hats and even just to produce music, you're kind of wearing a hundred different hats. You're the talent, you're the engineer, you're the mixer. And, uh, then you start throwing video stuff in there and, um, if you're a person that's not familiar with that stuff, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's overwhelming. It's a ton. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have to give Rob a lot of credit for kind of showing me the way because I, um, was very DIY. I kind of prided myself on being self-sufficient and being able to learn whatever I needed to learn and work hard and be an example of that and, and those kinds of things. And, um, I think I had to kind of get over this this weird thing about me where it was okay for someone else to be part of it, or it was okay mm. to recognize that someone else could do some of these things better than I could. Um, and, uh, you know, I started working with Rob and he would just like rent an actual music studio and there would be an engineer there. And I didn't have to think about anything with mic yeah. placement <laughs> or finding like making a new track in the DAW, anything like that. I was like, wow, you know, like, I know how to do this, but it's so great when I don't have to. And so, you know, we, we are able to have projects like that now where there's just like someone else who's behind the computer or the desk or whatever it is. And um, yeah, it really makes a difference. And I think, you know, I, I'm not opposed to either. I still do both, but it's like great to be able to embrace whichever one works. Yeah, good option to have. And I guess it allows you to really focus on the creative part the actual like writing the songs producing the music and having the fun with it without having to be like all right hold on now let me go over here and do this thing and fix yeah it, it really does like um you know it's a, it's a luxury but um and and sometimes you know not at all to diminish what engineers do but the, i think i had a mindset where i was like well if i need to stop and move a microphone or if i need to like kind of go back to my computer and set up a new track hit record or like figure out a bus or whatever <clears> um you know i I can do that. I should be able to do it myself. But whether it takes, you know, a few minutes or even just 15 seconds, like that is a little interruption to whatever flow mm. you're in. It, it doesn't matter what how small it is. It's still like you got to change gears. You got to put your attention somewhere else and then come back. Um, so, yeah, it, it can really make a bigger difference than um, for me, what at least what it felt like it might. Mm. Well, I can imagine that's hard to let go of too, with you know having your name on things, and there is a pride, the DIY thing. You know, that's that's a nice like kind of ethos that a lot of us have. Um, but it it seems too like it's a it's a musical thing as well, like letting go of maybe like the pride or the ego that goes into like controlling everything, and. I, I noticed that a lot. It's something I've really enjoyed about watching some of your stuff where you're collaborating with Rob and, and then the one with Ryan is you get to see this creative process. And in order to do what you're doing, to produce as much content, to produce, to be involved in so many projects, you've got to have, I guess, a spirit of like, yes, let's go and do that. Let's try this and not um, resist things and see where things go. And it, it comes out in the production as well. And then I think the music is another great example of where you see that. Yeah. No, I think that's true. It's so much about um, kind of like that improv rule, you know, yes and. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you, you got to like roll with things and, and be a supportive collaborator and, you know, roll with someone's idea. Try someone's idea because you really don't know until you're actually – hearing it like we we might like to think you know we could imagine that what something will be and decide that it wouldn't work but it can really change to actually just do it and then feel it and like mm. know you know what it is in reality um 
I also, yeah, I think that the uh, another part of it is like if you, um, I I don't know if if other people think of it like this. This is what I started to notice when I was doing uh, more sessions and how I try to approach it. I guess if you don't like a direction or an idea it's more about kind of like steering things or like throwing something else out there rather than like shutting that down or like talking Mm -hmm. about why something isn't working or whatever, like, you know, that energy doesn't need to be there. And it's, it's so much better to focus on like, okay, what else can we do? What, what needs to happen to get to the finish line? Right. Cause it's vulnerable, right? Anytime you're creating with somebody else, especially you're kind of putting yourself out there every time you put an idea out there. And if you get shut down enough times, you kind of like stop raising your hand, you stop offering suggestions. Um, it's really cool to see that happen when you guys work together because um, it's such an important thing I think we need to do with our music, even sometimes when you're working by yourself to just kind of go for it, see see where this road takes you. And um, That's so true. When you're doing something on your own, yeah, it's easy to in some cases, maybe even easier to talk yourself out of trying the idea or like taking the, the approach that's going to be a little harder or yeah, I I think that's a, that's a really great insight. It's like collaborating with yourself, being supportive of yourself and (laughs) and believing in your own ideas. Yeah, that's great. I, I think a great example of, um, what you guys do is um well the two come to mind actually i was watching one where you guys did a hundred riffs oh yeah <laughs> like to go one. with a hundred riffs is like so ridiculous right but to just plow through and see what you come up with and then you guys also do um an album in the beginning of october right every yeah for, first for of october day. for the rest of our lives that day is booked in the <laughs> calendar we try and write and record a full album in one day what kind of like uh creative hell does that put you through (laughs) (laughs) you know i mean well that's one of those situations where we have um rob rusha um who's rob scallon's longtime engineer and you know now i've worked with him so many times Mm. and um so we have a great chemistry just knowing that he is like you know he's the same guy behind the desk every time and um knows what we need to do to get through that type of a challenge now um and also just in general that it's that situation where we're not having to think about any of the technical details. We just pick up an instrument and go. So that helps a lot. And really it's very enjoyable. Like they're, I think, and we've gotten better at it too. The first couple albums, there are definitely some moments that I cringe at where we just like couldn't get an idea. I think there's one song where we even left in us just talking about not having time to make lyrics and, and whatnot. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've gotten better at like how the day needs to flow, like what things need to be priorities. Man, the first couple albums, I think we were like, oh, we'll do all the lyrics and vocals at the end. It'll be better to like do it in a batch, which is actually a terrible mm. idea. Mm. <laughs> like those things should come as each song is developing. And um, yeah, uh, just things like that we figured out. And so now it really feels great. Like we can just we know we can do it. We, we can walk into that room mm. and be like, wow, 12 hours from now, we're going to have 10 finished songs that d- did not exist in any way before this morning. Um, and yeah, I think the, it, it's really interesting because now that we've done it so many times, you notice these trends, like the first couple of songs are usually not among the best, um, like at all. Like usually we we do a handful and there might be like a gem in, around the fourth or fifth one. Usually the one that turns out to be our favorite and in many cases the audience's favorite is like maybe between the sixth and the eighth one of the day. Hmm. And then, yeah. So there, there's a lot of like warm up and a lot of like, wow, we did a lot of different ideas. We... um yeah, just, just got warmed up, <laughs> you know, and it mm. took hours and it took literally completing a bunch of other songs to get to this place where suddenly an amazing thing just comes out. And then after that, we're tired in the last couple songs kind of <laughs> are lower quality again, maybe. Um, th- that's just like a general pattern that I yeah. sort of feel like happens uh, on a lot of those now that we're at year five. But um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a great process, great, you know, learning process, a great creative process. 
year one, d- did you think you could do it? Were you confident that you guys would Not get it done? Oh, yeah. yeah. We thought it was just going to be like a joke video. Like, just watch us right. completely train wreck here <laughs> because it's such an absurd premise. And then we got through it better than we thought we would. And there are actually, you know, maybe two cuts off that album where we're like, wow, we, we love these songs. We'd definitely play them again. We'd love to polish them up maybe uh, if we decide to do that sometime. And so it, um, yeah, it made us realize that it's somewhat possible. And then, mm. yeah, just each year we kind of figure out better ways to structure the day or we just understand we were like better at recognizing when we're starting to waste time or worry about something that doesn't matter as much. Or, you know, we can just say like, yeah, we're happy with that take and move on. And, and again and again, we learn there are so many things that in the moment you're unhappy with or like, Oh, that drum fill was a bit off time or, uh, my, my vocal could have been stronger, but then a lot of that stuff just doesn't end up bugging you once it's in the final mix, Mm. you know? Right, right. You get a little too hyper focused. Yeah. But it's a good point because you prove to yourself you can do it. You do something really hard like that. And then the next time you show up, you're kind of like, well, we did it. You know, it's not impossible. We've figured that out at least. It's not impossible. So we, we can do it. Yeah, it's- for sure. Yeah. Each time, you know, we get more of that confidence and it becomes more of an exciting project to do rather than like, uh, a daunting kind of, uh, maybe it's going to be uncomfortable or maybe it's not going to turn out good. Yeah. We just like, I actually, uh, after the second year we did it, I wasn't sure if I was going to do it again. Mm. I felt like there were too many things on the second album that I didn't love and that I didn't feel like I wanted to go back and listen to. I was just like, ah, oh, is this really something that makes sense as, uh, you know, a, a long-term repeatable format, but I decided to to give it another shot. And then um, on the third year, it really felt like, oh no, we got to do this forever. Cause by that time <laughs> it just, we, it, we just crossed that point where it was like, okay, we figured out how to do this. Well, we're coming up with stuff that we like, I guess probably, you know, our chemistry had just like bonded even more. Um, and now I just can't imagine not doing it. Hmm. It's a great, tradition to have with somebody that you're close with like that oh it is i recommend it to anybody like if you've got a buddy or two that you love to jam with like try it out or or even you know take a few days to make something start to finish but um yeah make make it a yearly tradition it's some of the most Mm -hmm. fun ever there really is something that happens when you work with somebody and you finish something and you've both poured a lot of your heart and energy into it and then You've got something. You've you've documented it. You've created something out of thin air. It's the closest thing I know to magic, really. It's oh yeah, yeah. That yeah. never gets old, and I think that's why. Um, I mean, finishing is is just so important. I think uh, what this makes me think of is I have had different periods in my life where I'm like, oh, you know, if I'm just enjoying what I'm doing in the moment, shouldn't that be enough? And I don't know, maybe for some people it is, maybe it should be, but I think there is that like extra level of, of having that thing like done. It's, that's more satisfying for me than just like jamming and having a great time. And then it's over, like being able to, I guess, push myself and create something that I feel like is a little more special, being able to have something that you're able to share with other people mm. having something that maybe like connects on a deeper level. I think, you know, that stuff is also, uh, so important. So yeah, I think, yeah. Finishing is huge. <laughs> it's so hard yeah. for, for every artist, but I think sure. it's, it's like the most important thing. It's the thing we get the least amount of practice doing because it's the last yeah. step. Oh you yeah. Don't, <laughs> you don't always get there. <laughs> That satisfaction, though, I mean, I've done stuff by myself, solo records, and I, I, I love that. There's something really important for me in that. But the sharing of it is just something next level. Like when you have a couple people that you can just sit around with and say, like, yeah, we did that. You can listen back to what you did and and just know like you went through it together. You, you all understand the struggles and the challenges. Um, I guess, you know, we're just social creatures. So to be able to have other people that get it exactly what happened. 
Oh yeah, that's so true. Like just um yeah, being able to hang out with other people that make music and like, you know, we all have this thing where we just have to do it for some reason. Hmm. And um <laughs> yeah, having those kindred spirits around and and you know, even better working on something together and and having that kind of um I mean, it's a type of intimacy really. Like mm. you're Yeah. If if the work I think, you know, is uh I don't know. I don't know how to exactly like put a value on it or whatever. But I think you you are sharing real things uh, about yourself, even if you're making something that's like lighthearted or whatever. Like it, it's coming from you. You're like connecting with your collaborator. You're both having to like work together and um, and and I guess working towards that same finished thing that both of you are a part of. Like it's uh it's something special. It's something else. Yeah, it's, you know, when you're not comfortable with the people you're working with or you're performing and it's, you know, not well received, that's some of the most terrifying feelings there are. So anytime you go into some sort of project with somebody, you're you're risking that. You're taking the chance that maybe it won't go. I mean, after a while, you get to know who you work well with and there's a just an acceptance of each other, which is also great to have. It's, you know... Um, it doesn't come from every musical situation you get involved in, but it it takes a leap of faith. It, it certainly does. It's true, yeah, and that can be scary. And I guess it, yeah, it depends too on everybody's expectations going into things and and how well you know each other and all that. I think um, I, I feel lucky that I have uh, this kind of behind the scenes. Um, approach that I, that I do with a lot of my work or that, I, that you know, it's just become a part of me or my brand or whatever you want to call it, that I'm pretty transparent about my process and that um, it's not all finished, shiny products because in situations like this, whether it's with a collaborator or just on my own, you know, if, if something has been worked on and it didn't, didn't turn out great or it didn't turn out how we wanted to, uh, it's still so useful a lot of the time as some kind of content and, you know, content mm. is kind of like a, a, a terrible word in a lot of ways, yeah. but in terms of like cheap. having something that you can show to someone else on whatever these platforms that we're using and say like, well, this is what I was thinking and this is what I tried. This is what I like about it. This is what I didn't. And maybe, you know, someone else can take it and run with it. Or maybe someone else just, feels understood because oh someone else who is working on the same type of music as me also doesn't make bangers all day long mm. or um you know there, there's just so many it's such a nuanced complex process to create something that i think um being able to share what we can share uh, is so great it doesn't have to all be just like okay this is this is the official release and everything else is kind of in, in the trash can or something. Right, right. Well, I think music and art has gotten very commoditized. Commoditized, is that a word? But turned into like some kind of product, right? And it's mm -hmm. all about the finished product and you get the, the, the thing. But over the last, you know, whatever years it's been with YouTube, the internet, you get to really see the process. And, and that's really what anyone will really tell you is the important part is the process of showing up of putting in the work and the product you can't always control how it's going to come out you can't always control how it's going to be received but the process if you just trust in it and like the way you work where we get to see the process reminds us of that i, th I think that's a thing that a lot of people enjoy it's the same reason why it's so fun to hear the demos of like your favorite album like to mm. listen to like to watch the beatles working on get back and all of that stuff is like oh they're humans and they're they're doing it they're, it's hap it's not just this magical thing that appeared out of nowhere because sometimes the final product is that way and it's it seems impossible almost yeah um, no it's true and it's interesting because sometimes and I, I don't know if there's a way to predict when this is. Sometimes going behind the curtain feels like it takes away from the end product and you're like, you know, seeing how the sausage is made or whatever. Uh -huh. Other times it feels like it adds to it. And I don't know how to <laughs> balance that exactly, but I've just fully embraced like, let's show everything. I think I 
I remember being, you know, 15 years old and listening to my favorite bands and just not having any idea how they were doing what they were doing. Cause you know, this was pre um, social media for sure. This is very early internet. Um, there wasn't a lot of info. If you were just like someone with no ties to the industry and you're like buying these records, have no idea how these sounds are made, mm. um, how people write, like, you know, what does a producer do? All these kinds of things. Um, and I just remember thinking like, if I, you know, ever make it in any way, the type of musician I would like to be is the type of musician who shares and who mm. like that. I, I'm so, so down to like open up my projects and be like, here's the setting on every knob, you know, like I really want to let people mm. know um, just cause I guess as a kid, it would have meant so much to me to be able to see that and, and understand it and learn from it. Um, and so I've just, just fully embraced that as opposed to any kind of like secrecy. Although I don't have like time to, to be that in depth about every single piece of music I make, sure. but, um, yeah, I think that's the important. best we used to get was maybe in the artwork in the album liner notes or something, maybe some pictures or maybe like the lyric sheets scribbled out. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see. It's like, wow, they wrote the words down to that song. Like, <laughs> yeah, somebody sat down that. with a pen and did that. It's and wild. it's in a way, I think, taking us back to something a little more authentic. And you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with like trying to create a really perfect, polished package and like putting that out. But I think there were so many steps culturally and historically to get there, where mm -hmm. now that we have social media and it's um you know getting so much faster and easier to just share anything that kind of takes us back to i feel like what it would be like before any of this technology existed like if you were just listening to music live because someone was playing it and that was the only way you could experience music yeah you are seeing the process you know like you they they have to be there in front of you and then we got really abstracted from that with recordings where um, you just don't see the music being made. You don't even necessarily know what instruments are involved sometimes if you, if you can't pick them all out. Um, maybe you don't know what these people look like. And I don't know, maybe that should not be important, but um, there's definitely a, a remove, you know, there. There's a disconnect right. there. And um, yeah, I, I guess I don't really know if any of this is like, good or bad or whatever but i do think it is good that we have the option now to be much more connective i guess that's true we we can choose not to look if we don't want to ruin the fantasy or not or yeah like yeah that. and artists can choose not to reveal anything they don't yeah. want to and yeah yeah i think it brings out the humanity though and that's something we're i i think when i'm listening to music that's what i'm connecting with that this is another human going through these things that I can relate to, even if I didn't do exactly what they did or wasn't in that time period even, that to know that there's still these universal things and it was just a person sharing what they went through. Um, I love that we, we can find that a little bit more. It, it, uh, it's a way to connect. It, it makes you feel like you're not as alone in this world trying to survive here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and this is why I, uh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to end up like eating these words, but this is why right now I'm not really afraid of AI taking away mm. from what musicians have to offer. Like when I get really into music, it's not just the music. It's like knowing that there's that person behind it and like they went through something to get to, to this output. And, um, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, maybe we'll get to a point where it's indistinguishable where AI like even comes up with a backstory for an artist right, and generates right. their whole, you know, social media profile and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. I'm sure it, it could happen, but I do think there's, you know, we're just so far away from anything like that. I think mm -hmm. we are, we still want to connect with something truly human and, um, yeah, the, just just seeing the backstory, seeing uh, what someone went through, um, and even in a way, just knowing that that's that it was 
real, I guess, makes a difference. Yeah, um, and you don't always know for sure. I mean, people can can fabricate stuff, but I, I find that really interesting. And um, I actually I spent a lot of time wrestling with that in in a part of my book about authenticity, where it's so strangely contextual. It's so uh, and and it's it's so delicate. Like mm. the uh, the the audience really needs to, with music anyway, um, I think, feel like you're being real. And it's right. so strange because in, I think, other types of uh, professions, I don't know, like an actor is by definition, you know, not being themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's, we, we almost respect them the further away they can get from their real selves. Yeah. But I think that we we really can't do that. It, it's so hard with music to... Um, if you come across as anything less than genuine, the the wind is taken out of the sails in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. I guess we appreciate the actors and actresses that find something real in their performances Mm -hmm. um, that we can all connect to. I'm with you on the AI thing. Like when I was a teenager, started wearing like ripped jeans and flannels because I love Nirvana. Mm -hmm. Right. And, I don't know that AI is going to make me like change my outfit, you know, and like <laughs> adopt this kind of identity that you kind of took on because you connected with the artists you were into. Um, it, I think it's so much more than that. It's always one of the first questions I ask. I hear a song I like. It's like, who is this? I, mm-hmm. I want to know about them. And I, I've like, I've heard um, some pretty interesting, you've probably seen these online, like, you know, like Brian Wilson sings the Ramones or something like that. It's all oh, AI yeah. like bots doing it. And it's really convincing. I've heard like young Paul McCartney singing his new songs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're like, well, that's interesting. But I don't usually ever get to the end of the track. It's yeah. usually like, oh yeah, okay, okay. What else? What's What else is going on out there? Because it's, I, I guess I know that it's just not, it's not that thing. It's not, I'm not going to get that feeling from it in the same way. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, definitely interesting to see where it's going to go. But yeah, uh, yeah for now, we're it in feels for a like ride. This... That's, we can guarantee that. <laughs> What's that? We're definitely in for a ride wherever it's going. Yeah. Oh, it's... yeah. I think this, this past year and all the developments in that world have really uh, made a lot of the future uncertain, I feel like. Well, I think you're, you're probably the kind of person that's poised to do well because you are showing. You, you're taking us through it, you know, and some of these, these tracks you guys are working on and on the album, um, you see like the pain points, you know, there's moments of just doubt and frustration and, um, and then the joy of all that stuff. Like that's all stuff that people connect to. So I think you're set up for that. It's kind of interesting. Like we're talking about like being behind the scenes and now you've got your book coming out called make your own rules, which is mm-hmm. sort of, behind the scenes about being behind the scenes in a way. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I had someone else say to me a while ago, like I pull the curtain back on pulling the curtain back, which I thought was so <laughs> funny, but it's like, it's kind of true. Like once you get to a certain point of like uh, doing behind the scenes or showing the process, like the, how do you show the process? You know, I had a lot of people ask me like, can you show us how you make a YouTube video? Because your YouTube videos show us how you make the music. We have no idea how you make the videos. And then right. if I did that, <laughs> then no one would know how I made the video about making the video. I um, do that. <laughs> but it's, it's funny, those layers, but um, hmm. yeah, I don't, I don't really know where I was going with that, <laughs> but yeah, it's, the, it's the book funny is irony here or something. to, yeah. uh, I get, I guess in the book, yeah, it, it does, talk a lot more about what went into just my whole career and even you know what happened in my life mm. that led me down this weird path of, of a, a very different approach to um, finding a way to thrive in an industry that's very strange right. and always changing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard book to uh, sum up because it is intentionally all over the place. Like I do a lot of little... Um, little boxes where it's like, here's a self-reflection for you, or here's like something you can uh, like fill out. Um, or, you know, like there's a story from my like childhood. That? Pardon? Interactive kind of. A like little things. bit. Yeah. Some yeah. like, um, you know, things to think about. And then the occasional thing where it's like, oh, maybe try this assignment or that kind of thing. But um, 
yeah, then there's there's stories from my childhood. There's uh, stories of getting my career off the ground. There's like little pie charts of how my different revenue streams changed over the years. It's like mm. trying to, um, I guess, take a lot of different approaches to showing people, here's my very weird way that I approach things and also my general thought process about how I... Um, you know, kind of continue to evolve as the world and as all these platforms evolve. But um, also, like, mainly, I think it's about giving people permission to, in any part of their work where the traditional, conventional thing doesn't work, you can totally find your own way to do it. I mm. think um, that's that's the the heart of it. I think that's the exciting thing that's happening, you know, there's been so many scares in the music industry in the last like 20 years with the way things are changing, but it's really opened up so many opportunities for people to get creative and try new things and go places where no one's gone before. I got a kick out of looking back on your YouTube page. So I click like the oldest button, right? And I'm, uh -huh. now I'm looking at your first videos and I spent a, an hour or so today with uh, pink fluffy unicorns dancing around that melody oh, yeah. playing in my head. <laughs> But what I what kind of noticed was like a, sort of like a fearlessness in what you did and that you were just what you, it seemed like you were trying things that you just felt like doing. There's a lot of covers. There's a lot of like different interpretations. Um, th and there's no kind of like set style to any of the videos, really. You don't have the uh, high five that you've developed with the little uh, yeah. sparkles that come out in the beginning. Little like fun things like that that are now like kind of part of the trademark. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, was there something that happened at some point in those early stages that caught on that made you say like, hey, maybe this is, maybe I'm onto something here. This is kind of cool. It's, maybe it's getting a reaction or maybe you just felt kind of at home in it because it does seem like you're, you're kind of um, really just trying lots of different things. Yeah, you know, you definitely are right on the mark with that. I didn't have a particular direction and I was very excited about a lot of different things. And I figured I would just do whatever in the moment seemed fun and uh, within reach of my like capabilities at the time. <clears throat> and uh, this was also, this was, when did I start posting on YouTube? Like 2010 or slightly so earlier when I started to really <laughs> go <laughs> for it. Okay. Um, and at that time, there wasn't a culture at all of yeah. growing a following online. And so it wasn't in my mind to grow. Uh, I was already uh, doing kind of little music production and writing jobs for hire as kind of the main job. And so YouTube was just an interesting thing that I was compelled to explore um, without really knowing where it was going to go. Mm. And so, yeah, it was just like doing what I thought was fun. And then some stuff caught on, some stuff didn't, some stuff became more interesting than other stuff. And I sort of in tandem with uh, getting excited about posting more and more on YouTube, learned more about just branding, I guess you could call it. Just the idea that um, if your audience is there, they're going to have expectations, whether you like it or not. And how can you um, use that to your advantage, but in an authentic way? Like Because being all over the place is my MO. Like I'm still like that in a lot of ways, but I've just found good frames for it. Um, but you know, the genre of music I'm working on is different from day to day, from video to video even the like tone of it, you know, it can be quite different. I can write stuff that's quite dark. I can also go completely, you know, like kids songs, pink fluffy unicorns, comedic and all these different angles. But I think by being um, focused on yeah, at, at this, you know, kind of longish season of my career right now, it's been really about how do I show other people how they can also participate in making music and how fun it is. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, the earlier frames that I found were doing challenges. So I would, you know, I was always doing something kind of strange anyway, but if I just 
framed it as a challenge. I, I did the series called Song Challenge, and it might be like, can I make a song with just a balloon? Or it could be, uh, what if uh, like this classic jazz song was electronic? Or it could be like, what if I tried to rap in five languages? And these are completely unrelated ideas. But if I just set it up as like, is it possible? Ooh, it's a challenge. Then that became like a calling card and something that uh, people could tune in for, whether or not they cared about that genre or, you know, me as an artist even necessarily. So yeah, it was like slowly learning these things that I think a, a lot of uh, smarter people or definitely, you know, people who have any business or marketing background kind of understand um, where I guess I was in a mindset that, you know, a creative person should just be kind of free and whimsical and go from whatever to whatever based on their inspiration that day, which I think in part is still true and you have to have that that open play time. But also mm -hmm. there are so many things that are often quite simple that can just be really effective uh, for those kind of like outward goals of, oh, how can I sustain this? How can I you know build an audience? Um, if I can make money doing this, that means I'll have more time to do it and that's a good thing. So like figuring out how to just be a little bit smarter about some of that business planning strategic kind of stuff uh, was was big for me hmm well, was a lot to think about right especially when you're trying to also make music and produce some stuff that's interesting for people to watch but it's a great concept though just to give yourself those challenges because it does keep you in the act of doing stuff you're you're if nothing else, you're still making music. You're still flexing that muscle, still working at it, still practicing your craft. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it is a part of music that is just always uh, something that fires me up is like what happens, you know, when there's this restraint or what happens if we try to use this item that's not normally meant for music mm -hmm. or, or all, all, you know, now I'm getting more into just like weird studio tricks or like combining strange gear or things like that. But a lot of it for me is just that curiosity and exploration, um, which, you know, for whatever reason is just more exciting most of the time for me than saying like, Oh, I'm going to sit down here with my guitar now and write a song with three choruses. Um, and I love that too, but it's just, not as often what I go to when I could be um, discovering something because I decided like, okay, the snare drum for this song has to be me hitting a watermelon and <laughs> <laughs> what's that going to turn out to be? Yeah, yeah. Well, we are gifted with the blessing and the curse of basically every option possible now. Infinite oh, yeah. tracks, um, samples we can find forever, new instruments, presets, down, I mean... It just doesn't end. I think some of my most productive days were when I just had a four track and a guitar and a microphone. And that was it. So what am I going to do with it today? How am I going to make it sound different than the last song? How am I going to fool around and come up with something that's still fun and interesting? Whereas sometimes now I, I find myself just like scrolling through presets or plugins or, and just no, no. And, and that's the kind of the opposite of what we were saying earlier about the yes and philosophy <laughs> from uh you know improv comedy where if you're saying the snare drum has to be a watermelon getting hit then all right now you get creative how can i make this work what yeah. can i do to fit this in so it's kind of like it's built into that challenge mentality that you're you're, you're cutting out all those potential options and just let's do something with this see what happens 100 percent. and you know i what that makes me think of is um I think a, a an approach or an attitude that I definitely, um, you know, is still kind of part of me and I still feel like in a way maybe I'm outgrowing, but I know a lot of people maybe see a studio like mine um, where there's a lot of gear or, you know, they, they see someone who has like tons of different plugins or, you, you know, you're just, you have a splice subscription, you have millions of options. Hmm. And what it feels like the music making process should be is, 
you are working and then you need that one thing and you have it because out of your million options, you know exactly where to go. You got it. You pull it out. There it is. Now you can keep working. But I find actually it's so often the, I don't know if it's the opposite of that. It's not that. Sometimes, very occasionally, you're like, I know the perfect thing for this. And then you grab it out of Mm -hmm. your million options. Way more often what it is, is you start with a palette. And it's like, today I want to see what happens with these two guitar pedals. Or like, today I... (laughs) I'm scrolling through presets, but I'm, I'm picking this one. This one's speaking to me, and I'm going to run with it. And through that, it, it, like that, that's where tracks come together. You know, mm. um, it's uh, having that commitment and having that that limited little world, that little sandbox that you play in. It's so much more about that than having like every option so that you can call on the perfect thing at the perfect time. Yeah, yeah, I find that kind of like anxiety provoking when it's like well which synth should i use (laughs) which (laughs) oh i don't know like what's the right answer here and you wind up flipping through sounds presets plugging things in changing things out um to me that's not really being creative but when you say like i'm gonna make it i'm only using four tracks today Mm -hmm. something like that you're just like okay now i gotta think on my feet a little bit i know what i can use for that it's, it's. I think that's the modern day dilemma problem that we face now. You know, back in my four track days as a teenager, it was everything sounded like garbage, you know? <laughs> and I wish I had more tracks. And I wish I had more things, but um, now it's like, you know, you even just get the light version of any DAW, and you are like light years ahead, light years away. Yeah, I think, too, the thing that we're still um, figuring out because it's so new is what it means to be so connected all the time and how that affects mm. our process in uh, in more ways than one because, you know, obviously what if we're, we're scrolling these algorithmically curated feeds and for people like us, uh, I mean, I don't want to necessarily guess what's in your timeline, but I'm sure plugins and music guess. equipment is, is showing up. It's same as with far me. as I can tell, everyone in the universe is playing with synthesizers and guitars yeah. and <laughs> and they love dogs and, you know, like a, a couple other weird things. But yeah, that's so perfectly in, tuned in to what I want to see. Yeah. And so you're always like, you know, looking at a shiny new thing and that just wasn't the case even 15 years ago, um, certainly not for the majority of music making history did mm. people just have a like literally a new instrument they could learn about every single day and <laughs> wonder how cool it would be to play with that. And I think that's probably doing a number on us. I think in another way too, you know, we all feel the pressure to be active to some degree on these social platforms, and it's harder to feel like you can get away for a like removed enough break that you can really mm. do some deep work and yeah. you know maybe if you can like block it out for a few hours a day that's enough um but i kind of wonder you know does it does it change things if you really are just offline for weeks or months and uh i imagine it's got to <laughs> i'm sure i mean sometimes i feel like uh a hermit if I haven't been on email and like since you know I didn't go on email after dinner last night <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. oh my god <laughs> I feel like I have a beard and I'm eating beans in a mountain somewhere <laughs> you know um so the book um make your own rules coming out February I believe it said yeah, right February 6th but the pre-orders are open up until then and there's uh if you go to andrewhuang.com slash book, there's a bunch of bonuses and giveaways I'm doing for anybody who pre-orders. But yeah, it's uh, it's coming out. I spent a couple of years writing it and uh, I hope that it's going to be something that just gives a lot to uh, anybody who's a, a creator. I just, uh, you know, I had to unlock a whole lot of doors on my own and just figure things out and Mm. do a lot of things the wrong way. And I talk about all of that and I just want to, it's so gratifying to me. I I got this, especially from my online course, but also just from doing the videos that I do when someone leaves a comment and they're like, 
I suddenly, you know, understand what this music theory stuff is, or like you showed me how to finish songs or like anything like that. When I'm able to open a creative door for someone, it's so tremendously gratifying. And so I feel like with this book, it's, it's going to be the deepest that I will ever be able to do that. Um, you just can't, can't fit all this kind of stuff into a YouTube video. Sure. Well, think of how valuable that gift would be to you, you know, younger you to get those doors open for you. So to think that you're doing that for people and, and probably so many people and most of whom you don't even hear from, that it's, it's a pretty good gift to humanity. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's the hope. I think, um, yeah, I do often think about that. I think about the, the things, the questions that I had when I was a kid and the things I struggled with for years and years that some of them turned out like, Oh, if I just thought about it this way, or if someone just showed me how to do this thing, mm. like, it suddenly opened the door for all this other um, creative stuff that I could do or, or even just, uh, you know, maybe even more importantly, like how I felt about my work or myself as an artist, like um, being comfortable doing things a bit differently or knowing that it is really difficult sometimes or like knowing that there are strategies when you're faced with whatever problem it is. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, that, that that's what it's all about. And there's, I mean, we, we kind of touched on this before. It's so cool that we are able to communicate so directly and so much now, so easily now where before, mm. you know, just wasn't worth it to go through all the traditional distribution channels to let a kid know the settings on your compressor <laughs> or, uh, you know, something much deeper that it's okay to be different. You know, the band's mm. not going to put that in a press release. <laughs> right. I tell you, doing this podcast, I haven't had anyone tell me it's easy, you know, and as much as I don't want to wish that pain upon other people, it is comforting to know that everyone struggles with this stuff. And mm-hmm. and whether it's sometimes it's the actual technical stuff, sometimes it's the mental stuff, it's there, around every corner, <laughs> there's some kind of challenge or lurking, you know, trying to get you and stop you. And it's comforting to know like people have gotten through them. People have found strategies to work and um, it's nice to share, you know, something that might've worked for you might really save somebody. It might, might even save them from quitting and mm-hmm. have them keep going. So that's, uh, it's hard to put a value on those kinds of gifts really that you're giving to people. So I think yeah. you're doing great work, Andrew. <laughs> I, I love what you do. Seriously. Um, oh, I'm very that, happy man. to get a chance to, talk to you i've i've thought of you for a long time as a guest for this podcast <clears throat> so uh well, yeah your, your work me. means a lot to me and i know it means a lot to a lot of other people too i really appreciate that yeah thanks for having me really enjoyed chatting and um yeah well cool i'm gonna put um links to for people to order the book for your youtube for your for your um transit plugin with baby audio which is sick um all that stuff i got it all coming in the show notes so um, if anyone wants to check that out they can go there and um, appreciate that yeah yeah um, thanks so I, much i will be uh i guess i'll just say that those things are all great to check out and i'm not putting out anything big after the book for a long time <laughs> so, <laughs> so feel free to dig into those get a <laughs> lot out of them because uh yeah after the book i'm gonna lay low for a bit i think Maybe yeah, you, you probably need to write a book or, or <laughs> do something about writing a book now. The struggles yeah. of digging it because that's a whole other world. <laughs> oh man, yeah. All right, cool, man. Well, thank you, and thank you for listening to the show. Have a Thanks, great time. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. 
That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.